Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Run Mac. Berto Wills, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today, my friends. We have a very, very special guest. So what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to uh, let me just bring in the show right away because I want to spend some more time with you. Let's say, didn't you have the same topic yesterday? Oh, no, no, no. Actually, uh, I'm sorry, my friend. That's a different topic on, on that. And it turns out that I need to update that with Restream, and for some reason, I didn't. So before we get started, I'm, look, thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, thank you very much for pointing that out, Rudnan. That's going to change in one second as I pull up the file that has all that information for our Restream. Because the truth of the matter is, I think I forgot to update Restream. So as Restream updates and you refresh your screen, you will actually see what the right title is for the show. The title of the show today is, the title of the show for today is Maya Cummins, the late representative Elijah Cummins' wife, uh, joins us. She's going to discuss what she calls the COVID-19 New Deal as she runs for her husband's new office. Rudnan, refresh it and let me know that you uh, that it came out correctly and that it's showing the right thing on your screen because it's imperative that we make sure all is running correctly. So let me know if it, you saw the change on the screen on YouTube. I'm going to as well change it on uh, as well change it on our page here, local page that is, to make sure that it reflects exactly what we're talking about. Anyway. Maya is, uh, oh, F FB is continuing to show the same thing. Well, I better change FB as well, folks, because if I don't change FB, my friend, Mr. Rudnan, is going to say, it seems like you are given the same topic you had yesterday. And you know who comes first in this building, my peeps. Okay, I need to, uh, let's see if it allows me to edit it. Let me see if I can actually do an edit on the fly. It may not allow me to do it, but I'll try to do that edit on the fly because I don't want people to think that they're going to get the same show. No, 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 no. I want to go ahead and change it. What we probably... See, it, look, when you're running with one person doing all the work because I have not yet reached my limit as far as the amount of contributions to our show... It is a one-person operation. You know what? I don't think it allows me to change it while we are going live. I'm trying to see if I can. And let's see if it will allow. Oh, it may allow me to do it. It may allow me to do it. Let's see. It may allow me to do it. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. See more. Edit. And guess what? Guess what, Michael Rudnan? It looks like it may allow me to make that change. When I get it done, I want you to tell me if you see the change. Okay, I think it has changed now. Let me know if you see it, Rudnan. I'd like to know for sure if, if, it, if that change was made. Anyhow, folks, we're going to have a great show for you today. A great show for you today. Maya is going to come on and she's going to speak. So what I want to do is I want to get her... Uh, first, and then we're going to go into economics, we're going to go into COVID-19, we're going to go into all these other issues because I think they are of utmost importance. America is hurting. I just got off of a conference call with a whole lot of people, mayors, Congress people, all that kind of stuff. America is hurting. So what we're going to start is tell you what the show is about. Title of the show, Maya Cummins, the late representative Elijah Cummins' wife joins us and the economic update. Maya Cummins visits not only to talk about her race to win her former husband, Elijah Cummins' seat, but on the COVID-19 New Deal that she wrote. We also talk about the economy. Maya Cummins unveiled the bold new COVID-19 and the 21st century to ensure all Americans are tested, treated, and protected during the pandemic. Further, her plans call for every American working family and individual to have a meaningful job at a livable wage, affordable housing, safe neighborhoods, universal health care, universal available child care and preschool, excellent public schools, affordable higher education, and clean, safe environment. Uh, the second segment, we're going to talk about COVID-19 and the economy. So stay with us, folks, if you're just joining us as well. Please do remember to share. Uh, we're kind of behind right now, but we're going to get busy 
with Maya right now. Okay. Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Red. I'm Igberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being here with us. We have a very special guest today. You know, um, I heard a whole lot of info in the progressive space that say, Igberto, you got to speak to this uh, woman, the progressive woman in Maryland that's going to be taking over the, the, the one and only Elijah Cummins spot. Maya R. Cummins, how are you doing today? I'm well, but I'm delighted to be with you today, Egberto. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. So first of all, um, there, are, there are, I mean, there are so many people that are so impressed with you. They, are, they told me, this is a, the Maryland 7th District needs to have a Maya involved now, because once and for all, we need to break out of several things. One, we need to get out of the patriarchy, that male-dominated thing. And secondly... We need somebody that is not just standing for the status quo, but is ready to do that. So please tell me a little bit about yourself, first of all, Maya. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I think most people think my bio point is that, you know, I was married to Congressman Elijah Cummings and I was proudly married to him. But before we ever got married, I was already in the trenches fighting uh, for social justice. Uh, and, um, you know, I worked on Capitol Hill on the House Ways and Means Social Security Subcommittee. I was a chief of staff for former Congressman Charlie Rangel of New York. Um, I worked in the progressive uh, advocacy and think tank space, uh, serving as a senior resident scholar for health and income security at the National Urban League and a vice president of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Uh, so I have been in the trenches for a long time, uh, starting in Capitol Hill in 1997. Uh, and I am progressive. I have been fighting and have stood for a single payer national health plan for more than 20 years. Uh, I have uh, stood for and continue to fight for uh, universal family care. Uh, I have stood for and continue to fight for equity and economic justice. Uh, there are too many places like Baltimore with deep levels of inequality across the country. And we frankly need to do something about it. And the coronavirus epidemic, the pandemic that we're currently in, only shows us uh, doubles uh, my dedication to why we need to address this. Now, uh, I want to talk about what Maya is going to do for the district, first of all. But before that, I think it is you, you, one must draw a contrast and give people the reason why uh, they should take on somebody that doesn't have as high a profile as one's opponent as such. Kwasi yeah. Mpume has a hell of a lot of name recognition. And there are a lot of people within the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus, that have a lot of name recognition. Let me tell you where I stand from somebody watching national politics specifically. I see a lot of people running on names. I see a lot of people running on organizations. But I see a status quo within black and brown communities that's, that, that maintains a certain constancy. Uh, we constantly hear these people come in and say, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, I think if things stay the same, it's insanity. That's a Absolutely. definition of insanity to do things over and over. So while we're going to talk about what you're going to do, what is it about Kwasi Mfume that is not a fit for that district? So Mr. Mfume had his chance. He ran for the seat and won it uh, more than 25 years ago. I mean, more than 30 years ago. Uh, he is a 20th century candidate and we are in the 21st century. Uh, when he ran and won, he did not prove himself to be a leader. He did not prove himself to be transformative and he did not prove himself to be progressive. Uh, I think Mr. Mfume uh, is currently in the pockets of Big Pharma. Uh, and historically, you know, he was the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, when the 94 crime bill uh, was passed, he not only voted for it, but he was an active champion for it. And he rallied the other Congressional Black Caucus members to get behind it. And the question becomes is what did he get for it? Uh, and he certainly got nothing for the African-American or black and brown communities for it. Uh, in fact, he was responsible. He was tasked uh, with getting the, the Racial Justice Act, which was uh, an act that was designed to make sure that death row uh, 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 defendants had the ability to use aggregated data uh, to show racial biases uh, in the justice system uh, in order to make their argument and their defense uh, for life. 
uh, and he didn't even win that. Uh, he gave that up early. Uh, and while continuing to advocate for passage of the criminal, uh, the, the 94 crime bill. And everybody knows what happened there. You know, black and brown men especially ended up going to jail for nonviolent, primarily drug offenses uh, in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, so Mr. Nfume, frankly, is not right for this time. It's time for us to move forward, uh, not move backward. It's time for us to have an equity agenda. And that is what I'm running on. I love the way you say that it's time for us to move forward. There are a lot of these other people that had their chances, as you said, to make a difference in the community. Now, I've been to Baltimore several times. There are two Baltimores, and we all know that. There are two Baltimores, and we know where that stands. I hope, I hope that uh, more, I, I, I respected what uh, Congressman Elijah Cummins constantly tried to do. I respected how he was among the people. I respected all of that. Now I... I see that in the research that I've been doing about you. I see you are the, you can't do it now, but the touchy-feely uh, person with the people of the community. And I think that is what, it, what is really needed out there. Now, you came out with something known as the Bold New Deal for uh, COVID-19 and the 21st century. I want you to uh, sort of expand on that and let people know exactly what that means not in terminology for let's say you and me who understand policy but for that guy that is riding down those streets on baltimore on a bike that needs a reason once and for all to go out there and vote for that per that mother that is sitting down in the house that needs a reason once and for all to go out and vote and say this time it's going to make a difference Americans are hurting, and they were actually hurting before the coronavirus hit. Uh, and so what we have here in this country uh, is intense pain. Uh, and that pain is that workers have been trying for, for decades now to get ahead uh, with no actual um, you know, result. Uh, now we have more than 24 million unemployed Americans. We've got essential workers working on the front lines with no personal protective gear, almost practically ensuring uh, that they're going to catch the coronavirus and perhaps horribly bring it home to their families. Uh, we have people who are desperate. They don't know whether to hold on to their, uh, you know, their jobs at the, you know, the supermarket or at the meatpacking plant uh, or to quit and enter the lines of the unemployed. Uh, and, and, and people are desperately food insecure. Uh, you know, if they are unemployed or if they were already on food stamps, otherwise known as SNAP, uh, you know, they were, their benefits were already running out uh, before the end of the month. We do not have an adequate safety net in this country, and we need one. So the bold new deal for the coronavirus COVID-19 basically calls on us to Protect our frontline workers. If the president, and I say this lightly, number 45, uh, actually believes that we're in a war against an unseen enemy called the coronavirus, then that means that we all need to be treated like uh, uh, soldiers on the front lines. And soldiers on the front lines, having come from a military family, get universal access to health care. Uh, they get dental care. Uh, they get the equipment to make sure that they are able to protect themselves. Uh, they get uh, and, and they have food assistance. Uh, they have an adequate income to make sure that they get uh, the, the kinds of uh, things that their family needs, have the income that their family needs. Uh, and so and they certainly get uh, to make sure uh, that um, uh, that, you know, that the shelter is available. So what the Bold New Deal calls for uh, is universal access to care immediately, particularly for those frontline workers who need hazard pay on top of their regular pay, uh, who need the PPE. We need to guarantee their PPE. We need to guarantee that access. It is unacceptable uh, that we have frontline workers without access to health care. We need to guarantee and make sure uh, that they have shelter. Uh, and we need to make sure that we are uh, addressing the food security needs of American, the American people across the country. Those are just a few of the highlights of the bold new deal uh, for the coronavirus era. Now, uh that is that is great because I, I'm I, we are yearning to have people in Congress that understands that we're yearning to find people in Congress who understand that first of all the money is there. Many like to make come under the impression that 
We can't afford it. Of course, we can always expand the money supply, quantitative easing and otherwise when it comes to corporations. Let's make, let's do it for people now. And that is what I'm hearing in your voice, that you're out there saying, let's make sure and take care of uh, uh, people first. Now, Maya, I think um, that uh, more than likely, if I understand it correctly, uh, the establishment has a preferred candidate. How do you tell the people why you should be the preferred candidate and to take a chance on you? Personally, I don't think it's a chance. But why should they it's take not a, a chance, chance on I you? have a more than 25, a 20 year track record of progressive getting things done, rolling up my sleeves and getting things done. I stood on the front lines to take on George W. Bush's efforts to privatize Social Security. And I helped beat a sitting president of the United States of America. I will always protect and defend our social safety net and our social insurance system. Uh, I have been on the front lines of making sure that we have healthy communities. For 10 years, I led an initiative called Leadership for Healthy Communities that fought for healthy food access, that fought for green spaces and safe places to play for young kids, that fought uh, to make sure that childhood obesity and obesity in general is something that we are focused on and making sure that we have healthy populations where we address health disparities. I have had a proven track record on all of these issues, including public education, where I think it's unconscionable that if we're in the wealthiest nation in this world, uh, we're still relying on the relative wealth of the school, uh, of, the, uh, of the, 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 the homeowners and the districts where children live in order to educate and finance our children's education. We can do better than this. We are better than this and we need to do better than this. And I stand for a progressive agenda that is forward thinking uh, and I'm ready to roll up my sleeves because I have current relationships on both sides of the aisle. Unlike my candidate who hasn't been there in more than 25 years. I, uh, you know, I've been called to testify on, on both sides, on the House side and the Senate side on Social Security issues. I'm considered an expert. I have advocacy relationships that I am ready to just uh, basically spark. Uh, and so I am ready to lead on day one and be the voice for the people. In closing, Maya, uh, what have I not ans- asked that you would have liked to say? I just want to say that, you know, I am also very much uh, in the mold of my husband. And I'm about integrity. Uh, and I'm about standing for the right thing and doing the right thing for the people. For the people. Uh, and so with that, you know, this is about uh, advancing uh, Elijah's legacy. It's about standing up for and defending our democracy as well making sure that I'm standing strong against Donald Trump and the Republican agenda to take us back 60 plus years. Uh, And so with that, you know, we have work to do. This is a battle for the future of our democracy. And I am ready to stand on the front lines fighting that battle. Maryland District, Congressional District 7. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. One hopes that you do the right thing. Maya Cummins, it's been my pleasure to speak to you. It's been my pleasure to listen to you. And I think you would do very well for the district. Thank you, Egberto. Thank you so much. Before I get any further, let me just go ahead and address a few things. Daniel Ledo, I, I, I love when, when I bring on any of these candidates, right? The first thing that my good, good, good conservative brothers, and only brothers, not the sisters, just the conservative brothers, would try to go ahead and pull them down. So he says, Maya and her shady management of Center for Global Policy Solutions. I can almost guarantee, Ledo, you don't even know what that is. But that's okay. (laughs) It's okay for you to try that. Anyhow, before I get any further, I want to bring up again, you know, yesterday we spoke about uh, Ahmad, um, Ahmad, what's his name? Ahmad, the guy who was uh, murdered, Ahmad Arbery, who was murdered in Georgia. And I wrote a piece on my newsletter, and since everybody doesn't get my newsletter, by the way, folks, go ahead and go to egbertowillis.com or politicsunright.com and sign up for the newsletter. But I wrote a piece that I want to read to you, the the deep feelings that I have about this, and it goes as follows. Reliving it all over again. Reliving it all over again. In other words, uh, it is hard to explain the feelings of vulnerability that the acquittal of George Zimmerman left with many people of color, especially black men. You see, you can be minding your own business and irrespective of your socioeconomic status, religion, employment, or otherwise, being in that skin makes you a target. 
Too many times it's from those who should be there to serve you, police officers who perpetrate violence and hate. But deeper, when one feels that even the majority population at large can make you a target of choice because they know the probability of justice is low or acquittal high, it makes it clear to too many that your life is less valuable and as such, survival becomes tactical. As an example, Joe Biden was an economically poor choice, but to many POCs, a tactical choice. Understand that, a tactical choice that one should not have had to make. Ahmad Arbery brings back those same feelings, anxieties, and vulnerabilities. I remember the hurt my sister and I felt when my nephew wrote an essay that showed a level of comprehension of the plight no then 16-year-old human should have to acknowledge. American society continues to show a bias of disregard until forced to act. It should not be this difficult. If we stood for what we really claim to be, it wouldn't. I wrote the following essay during the Trevon Martin debacle. Unfortunately, while one would have hoped enough would have changed, a president and a sect in this country are committed to using false differences for ulterior motives. We must decide if we will let them succeed. And I have a link to the uh, article that I wrote that I'd like you guys to read as well called I Was Trevon Martin the Day I Came to America. The link is there in our newsletter. It's also on our page. I was Trevon Martin the day I came to America. I just wanted to make that statement out because, again, everybody's talking a lot of super, uh, superficialities of this murder in Georgia. But deeper than the superficialities of the murder in Georgia is what occurs in the psyche of people when they feel they don't have those strings attached to society. What strings am I talking about? The strings that says that if you are wronged, something happens to those who wronged you, lest they continue or have the ability to do the same because there are no consequences. So therefore, we should get our act together because eventually when a people, any kind of people, start to feel that there's nobody watching their back, that there's no hope, that there's nothing to lose, different acts start to take place. So it's in the country's interest. It is in the country's interest going forward that justice be done. And luckily, it seems like even the Georgia Department, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, realized that reality. Because as soon as this evil was made public, as soon as this scourge was made public, they acted. But like I said in the commentary, like I said, it should not be this difficult. If we stood for what we claimed that we stand for, we shouldn't have to wait for an outcry. We shouldn't, once an evil has occurred, we should be ready to mitigate said evil right away. So I hope those of you that are listening to this, this right now, whether live or on podcasts or on vlogcasts or otherwise, take heed to this. This will go on and on until it doesn't. Unfortunately, there are only two ways that it doesn't. Let's make sure it's the first way that it doesn't. Okay, now, um, today the unemployment numbers came out. And the title on the Common Dreams was Most Cataclysmic. And let me put that on the screen. But I think that's worth seeing. Most Cataclysmic Jobs Report of Our Lifetime shows U.S. unemployment soaring to levels not seen since the Depression. <coughs> let me tell you, while the official government figure is 14.7%, <coughs> Some economists estimate 
the actual unemployment rate is around 23.6%. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt that it is really 23.6%. It's actually more than that. Because there are people that are unemployed, underemployed, doing whatever they can, and those that have just dropped out of the market. <clears throat> so here's the deal, people. Uh, let me read the first parts of the article, and then I want to get into my narrative. Just a day after announcing that there are 33.5 million Americans that have filed jobless claims since mid-March, as the coronavirus pandemic has caused lockdowns worldwide, the U.S. Department of Labor on Friday revealed the nation's official unemployment rate hit 14.7% last month, its highest level since the Great Depression. I think the Great Depression at its maximal, at its apex, was, I believe, 25%. If I'm not mistaken, it was 25%. Before the April jobs report released, Heidi Shireholz of the Economic Policy Institute warned on Twitter that Friday would be the most cataclysmic jobs day of our lives and shared a chart showing how recent unemployment claims contrast with the past 80 years before detailing current conditions in a 22-tweet thread. While the 14.7% figure for April is significantly higher than February 3.5 and March 4.4, it fails to capture the full scope of how U.S. workers have been impacted by temporary business closures and hours reduction that have resulted from the ongoing global health crisis. The report says 5.1 million Americans had hours cut in April. Shareholds, uh, senior economist and director of policy at EPI, explained that only about two-thirds of coronavirus-related job losses are showing up as unemployed. So therefore, we have a whole bunch more not counted. The rest are showing up as having dropped out of the labor force. Think about that. That is saying they're not even looking. It's just dropped out. So it's really much higher. If all coronavirus-related job losses had shown up in the unemployment report, the unemployment rate should now be around 19%. 19%. I'll... Ledo, I'm going to, I'll, I'll answer your statements, dear, because you guys are missing the point. And you know what I want to do? I want to play a piece here uh, to show how many are missing the point. Some people are saying, yeah, but this is a temporary thing. Uh, how temporary is this thing again? I want a, a Republican, two Republicans were, two women, smart women, two Republican women, were on the newscast earlier today, and they actually, I was very impressed with what they had to say, right? And the reason I was very impressed with what they had to say is they get it. They're not falling for what Donald Trump is trying to tell people to believe, right? Donald Trump is trying to tell folks, oh, this is temporary, this is just caused by, this is caused by the virus, and as soon as the virus is mitigated, everything is going to be all right. Now, this uh, peace just came on as soon as I was putting the show together, so I I didn't have a chance to uh, put it in nicely. So as I'm speaking right here, I am actually queuing the data up. I processed it about a minute and a half before the show. But what I want to do is I want to play what she had to say because what she had to say was prescient. And Americans have got to understand that this is where we're headed. Check this out. Uh, let's see. Is this one here? It's this one right here. Check this out. Lise, I'm stunned by the fact that there isn't a conversation about retraining the workforce. I mean, right now, working from home is a luxury. It's the new, you know, top 1%. What are, what, what, what are sort of the things that would happen in a normal White House, in a normal government, to retrain a workforce for the kinds of jobs that are going to come back? Nicole, I think you nailed it because what... I was so upset about listening to the Trump to President Trump's comments. He isn't setting expectations that this is going to be really, really hard. While I think that a certain amount of optimism for the fourth quarter is great, we can, uh, you know, the president being optimistic can sometimes help the mood of the country. But he isn't pointing out just how difficult and what a seismic shift this is, you know, an industrial revolution level shift that 
the economy just might not come back and be what it is. And what is the government doing to anticipate that maybe the restaurant industry isn't going to recover? Maybe some of those service jobs just aren't going to be there. What can be done to help people prepare for jobs in a dramatically different economy in what's shaping up to be a totally new historic era? And, you know, I love listening to people who think further than their nose. I love to listen to people who can see beyond. Because what she is saying is prescient. Let me explain to those who don't quite want to get it on the, on the, from the right-wing fringe, if you will. They want you to believe, in order, it, it, they, they want you to believe that we, we, we were coming from a great economy. And in coming from a great economy... Uh, we are just going to rebound after this coronavirus goes away. Well, there are two items that folks don't realize, and I'm going to come with the first one real quick. It call, capitalism does something special. It, it believes in efficiency, if efficiencies at all costs. In fact, this epidemic is really, really bad in America because of capitalism at the max. Where capitalism is mitigated by great regulation and great social justice and great social programs, none of those economies cratered like ours. None of them are going into a severe depression like we are, uh, that we are heading into. And the reason why is those people understood what it took to inflate their, 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 their people. They invested in their people. Nobody cared about having to go to the doctor because it's going to cost. It, all of those structures are there to help human beings. These are structures that our evil empire here, those who control the system, never look at. So what are the what is our laissez faire type capitalism want will want to do as we move forward? Let me just warn those people who are invested in REITs or EITs, you're about to lose your shirt. And let me explain. Uh, there are a lot of companies now that decided to have people work at home. And they realize that it is a lot less expensive to pay for those people's high-speed internet connections, give them a laptop, and say stay home, and reduce their electrical bills, and reduce their real estate bills, meaning they don't need as much office space, and reduce all these things. They were forced to test a new paradigm. Corporations were forced, because of the coronavirus, to test a new paradigm. And in testing that new paradigm, guess what they found out? Some companies found out that they could run more efficiently. Uh, Sweden, oh boy, you better read up about Sweden, my friend. But anyway, uh, they, they learned that they could run more efficiently at a lower cost. And what does capitalism do? It wants to be the most efficient allocator of resources. So therefore, real estate by design will start to fall because a lot of companies are going to keep the current paradigm of working at home and bringing a smaller staff into the office. If you bring a smaller staff into the office, you need less room. If you need less room, you need to cool less. You need less telephones. You need a lot less utilities and all these other points. So they're going to notice that. So that in itself will reduce the economy because all those people that used to go into work used to buy gas, they used to go out for lunch, they used to do all these things that they're going to be doing at home now. So the restaurants that they served, the gas stations that they served, all these things that they served mean a lower in demand of those items. So that is a reduction in business. But continuing, restaurants. Restaurants are going to see less business, but also getting, it is one thing to have a restaurant open. President Trump can say, Go back to work, except for factories where you are there doing something at the factory for things that are not necessities. In other words, if I don't have to work at a factory, uh, I'm not going to a restaurant. I'm not going to a playground. Uh, like Congressman Grayson said yesterday, he said, look, Disney World is going to be empty for a while. Disneyland is going to be empty for a while. All these places where a lot of people congregate just for fun. 
are, are there's going to be a different paradigm. And as this occur, and as people start to learn how to activate and do their activism online, Zoom, all those corporations like Zoom and the new guys that are going to come to market with Zoom-like products and enhancements, they're going to do just fine. But they are going to be very low intensity, low people type of corporations coming. So as the wom woman said on, on the, pro the, the thing that I just pointed out, we are coming into a new economy. Coronavirus didn't just pause the economy. Coronavirus changed the economy. And those do, who do not understand that it's a change that we're looking at will fail. Now, um, no, no, Ledo, it's not a contract economy. You have to understand the difference. A contract economy would be something like what you have with... Uh, with Uber or Lyft or one of those. These will still be employees just working from a different domain. That's what we're talking about. So anyhow, so th th those are the concepts that we have to look at. We're not going back to the same. But beforehand, there are a lot of cleanups. The economy wasn't in great shape. Uh, we had the illusion of a good economy under Trump. Americans... Over 50, I think it was more like 70, 80% of Americans were $400 away from not being able to do what they needed to do. Most Americans. Most Americans didn't have a, if they had a $400 bill, they couldn't handle it. Most Americans. And that was a society we had with full employment. 3% or something like that. I, imagine that. We have an economy. That is at full employment, 3%. When, when we call 3% full employment, what we mean is people are transitioning, right? So as you transition with 3% in employment, you'll always have that group that's unemployed as soon as they go from one job to another. So it turns out that the laws of capitalism that folks have always claimed failed. Because if you really had full employment, you would not have people wanting based on wages. You would not have people not being able to have a $400 bill because these people would have the power. They would have this, the power of supply and demand. The demand for my labor, should, given that my labor is in short supply, I would be able to command more money. But since capitalism, as I've always told you, is really a fraud, it has, it's a lot deeper because capitalism comes with a certain amount of fear-mongering onto the people. Well, here, and here's what, how capitalism has failed to increase the salaries on Americans based on supply and demand. People say, oh no, I mean, they could demand. No. Capitalism tells them this. Remember the definition of capitalism says, the efficient allocation of resources, and I add, at all cost. How is that done? Let me tell you how that's done. They go out there and they tell the employees, okay, you want to raise? Fine. But guess what we're going to do? We're going to go to a different market. And because we control the government with our, the way we have allowed them to write laws, if this factory wants an increase in wages and we don't want to give it, we move this factory to Mexico, China, Vietnam, Philippines, somewhere where we can get more efficient labor, labor that costs less, and if that is the case, the worker, of course, in America is going to lower their demands, which is exactly what happens, which is what we call the failure of that tenant that says, whatever the market will bear and the efficient allocation of resources. Because if you're not in a standard system, if you are not in a system that says we are playing on the same field, then you can always out, every American worker can be outbid And eventually it's going to go down to doctors Eventually it's going to go down to everybody else Because as we do more tele you know, you know what else coronavirus did? Coronavirus proved that telemedicine is great It's great for that person who can stay home And a doctor make a good calculation As far as how to cure them And if you don't have to go into the office So guess what? That doctor that was sitting down at Kelsey Siebel, that, that or, or at some Blue Cross and Blue Shields clinic here in your town, it doesn't matter if that doctor is now a part of Kelsey Siebel, but occupying India or Vietnam 
are the Philippines. So check this out now. Capitalism where it's head again because here's what happens now. The doctors we can pay in Philippines a lot cheaper. We get a bunch of doctors in the Philippines. We do telemedicine as Americans come out and they go in front of their computer and that doctor starts to diagnose what's wrong with them. And if that doctor in the Philippines now believe that that person needs to be seen by a person, they go ahead and they say, okay. Now you need to go into the Kelsey Sebo on 1960 or the Kelsey Sebo on Kingwood Drive or somewhere else. And then you see a local doctor. So what you do is you get small amount of doctors in America. But the vast amount of doctors who's handling telemedicine elsewhere. Coronavirus has changed the American experience. Coronavirus has changed the American economy. And those people who think things are going to be there before, capitalists are always there seeing how can we maximize our income for the shareholders and nobody else. The stakeholders are the consumers? No. The stakeholders are the employees? No. People, understand why in Congress today, you better go ahead and create social programs that's going to mitigate what's going to be happening in this new economy. Because while we sit down there and talk about right and left and all these issues, those son of a guns are out there thinking, wow, we've, we didn't even have to do it on our own. Coronavirus gave us some help. Coronavirus gave us a proof of concept. And the proof of concept that coronavirus gave us, hey, it works. Look, my wife used her telemedicine. She didn't have to burn any gas to go see the doctor. She didn't have to burn any of her time to go see the doctor. She didn't. She didn't. New paradigm. And guess who pays in that new paradigm? You do. So as all you right-wingers who decide to listen to me, I love you. I love you. I love you. But listen to me and not try to forget your right-wingism and say, I'm going to think about humanism. Why? Because that is how we are going to make the change. We have to be there before they're there. We have to start understanding what they are going to do before they do it. Because if we don't, we pay the price. Because after they've codified it into law, you know how as hell difficult it is to get out of there. So what I'm telling my dear brothers and my sisters is this. Please listen to me. It is important that you understand that this paradigm change that's coming, it's going to be continuous, it's going to be constant, and all the while there, if we sit back and just wait, they are not waiting. They are not sitting back. They are busy seeing how they are going to change this paradigm for you. And you know who's going to pay? You. In unemployment, in poverty, health-wise, and everywhere else. Brother, bro, so you guys can sit back. And decide what you want to do. I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be fighting like hell. I'm going to be out there telling the message like hell to all who will listen. Because I once I do understand deep on the inside how our system work works. You have to understand. You don't matter. You are but a prop. You are a prop that is activated when we need to get something out of you. And after we've gotten what we needed, we let you fight among the peons to see which one of you classify or qualify for the crumbs. We're all in the same boat. And until we learn that, until we understand that and stop allowing the plutocracy to put us against each other, we will continue to, to be in this position that we are currently in. So I want you to think about it. Let me go to the messages. I'm down to 47, so it's just about time for me to get up there and start reading. Okay, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Michael Rudnan reminded me that I didn't update some of my leads, so I did that. So thank you so kindly, Michael. Ah, let, me, let me call out all of you first. Michael Rudnan, welcome aboard AVQ. I like to say Avan John Q, but it said it's AVQ. Welcome aboard AVQ. Uh, welcome aboard Daniel Lado, Michael Cisak, uh, Lawrence Sims, uh, Kaney, welcome aboard. Kane, Kane, I'm sorry, Kane, welcome aboard. Uh, who else is here? Lee Grant, I think I called you out already. 
All right. Anybody want me to call them out, just go ahead and come into the main message area and I'll be more than happy to give you a shout out. I'm going to start from the bottom and I'm going to work myself up. I think it'll, that'll work. Egberto, I just got noticed today that another auction house I got through to sell my livestock will be closing because the regulatory costs you have been pushing finally put them out of business. Michael Cisak, hey, Normal Reynolds, welcome my brother. Listen to me, Michael Cisak. Until you get over that, brother. Brother, get over that. It's the regulatory. Go look at the big corporations, okay? Look at the people that look at the people who the look at the people who the politicians that you support who support the people who are causing that to occur. Let's remember that. Look at the guy who runs, I don't remember his name right now. He said, This is Trump's uh, this is Trump's, uh, uh, not environment, uh, Trump's, uh, what do you call that? The agricultural secretary. Trump's agricultural secretary says, and this is his words. This is your guy's words. He said, most farms that are small are going to be out of business. That's just how it works. Big ag business is what it's all about. Look it up. That's what your guy said. We want you around, Mr. CSEC. We want small farms around, Mr. CSEC. We want cattle, those small ranchers like yourself around. The person that is killing you are those folks, the big ag companies, ADM and all the others, that want that, that's saying, we're going to eat you all up. And you keep voting the way you vote, brother, and watch yourself get eaten up, sir. All right, let's say Michael Rodney, CSEC, an article... For you, for after the show, Marx Group owner and prominent blogger Gene Marx considers himself a smaller government, fiscally responsible, right of center guy, but he concluded that single pair would be the best for business. Uh, you know, I spoke, uh, here's the funny thing about it. I spoke to um, Rick, uh, to, to Jim Renessi today. He is a multimillionaire. He represented uh, Ohio Republican. We had a great conversation. You guys have to listen to it on Monday. I think I played on Monday. It's a, a congressman from Ohio. Uh, he came in on the Tea Party wave. And uh, it's amazing how much we were able to kind of uh, mix heads about. And I, I told, like I told him, if we speak a little bit more, I would actually be able to convince him of that single-payer health care. What happens, uh, uh, um, Rudnan, is as you start to make sense to these people that don't, don't quite see it because they've been framed into the Powell Manifesto way of thinking – you finally get to those who decide that they want to think with their own brains instead of being brainwashed. That oh, the numbers do add up. You know that you know the the, the the right wing had to find a way to get people to be irrational, right? So they they created this thing called freedom, and it and what I call it is freedom to be stupid, right? In other words, freedom to disregard math, freedom to do all these things. In other words, hey, wait a minute, why do I want to pay an executive multi million dollar salaries? And advertising when all they're doing for me is pay a bill. Because I'm free to make a choice. But do you make a choice or are you selecting which slave owner you want? When you have to choose between insurance companies, you're choosing who decides who you decide to have command you. Purdue, thank you very much, Norma. Purdue, look him up, my dear brother CSAC. Purdue, your guy said that smaller businesses in form, smaller farmers are out. Smaller ranchers are out, and they're doing nothing to protect them. Your guy says he's doing absolutely nothing to protect you, and then you blame regulations. Ha! Huh, come on, guy. Go, go find the information. It's not too hard to find, sir. Maybe I should put... Actually, brother, I'm pretty sure Rudnan is going to come up with the article pretty soon because I can always count on brother Rudnan. Okay. Uh, Mike Cisak, seems like Berto is calling for a much smaller government, one that involves so much in the economy. Whoa, awesome, Egberto agrees with me. No, I'm calling for right-sized government. And you know what? Look, it's not about me agreeing with you, Mike. If you have a great idea, do you think I'm not going to agree with you, sir? I mean, I don't agree with people or disagree with people. I agree and disagree with ideas. That's what it's all about, brother. That's what it's all about. And you should try to find a way to get that. Uh, let's see. Let's see. One other thing here. Let's back up, back up. Sweden is relatively ethnically and culturally homogeneous country. This has produced high trust, a high trust society. We don't have that in the United States where half the country hates the other half. 
That is by design, my brother Lee Grant. And I, I'm actually glad that you said that. Yeah, Sweden is fairly homogeneous, but it's not the homogeneity that allowed them to have a system like that. It is intelligence and following the facts. We don't have bad policy because people don't trust each other because we're not homogeneous. That's not why we have this problem because here's the deal. I, I'm going to put it bluntly. The, uh, the, the, people on the majority of people on both sides in the Senate and the House are white. So it's not a problem of homogeneity. We just have one set of people that support in something and another side that support the other thing. But here's the, most, most, the thing that I want you to most understand. The problem with not getting something like single pair like all these other homogeneous countries have is not that we don't have homogeneity. It is because neither one, neither side really wants single payer health care, Medicare for all. Don't you get it? I've said it already. I'm not going to defend Democrats on this. Neither Democrats or Republicans, rank and file, not rank and file, uh, uh, leadership want Medicare for all because they're both paid by the same people. Don't you get it? You, you, you're missing the point. The point isn't that we're not homogeneous because our leadership is fairly homogeneous. Go, you know, Houston is a 33, 33, 33 city, meaning, you know, the three major groups in this city. But still yet, the power is pretty damn homogeneous. Folks, let's look at the reality of how things work. Let me jump down to the, looks like new messages coming. So since Sweden is so intelligent, we probably should have followed their lead in Kung. There you go with that phrase. I'm not going to use that phrase. I mean, that's shameful, uh, Ledo. I mean, that you don't see that yet, it's abominable, but that's okay. Uh, anyhow, let's see. Let's see other messages to come here from. Para ver, para ver, para ver. See, does Europe have a hard time impact the average Americans lives as it regards to riding out the pandemic? I'm not seeing it. Wait, let's see. Does Europe have a hard time impact the average um, the, 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 I don't, I don't know if I quite understand, but if I, if, if I'm understanding you right, Rudnan, the thing with European countries is they could have it as hard as we have with debts, etc. But the thing about it is they have a social safety net. We don't. That's the difference. They have a social safety net. We don't, and that makes a difference. All right, let's see. I'm going to go up top a little bit. Okay, let Joe. Uh, oh, there we go, Ledo. We're trying to disparage Maya. That's all right, Ledo. I won't read it. Okay, let's see. Uh, anyhow, there are some other subjects that I wanted to talk to you about. I want to bring this one up real quickly because I want to show you guys what, re what capitalism really is. If you take a look at this article, what a rigged economy looks like, says Sanders, as stock market enjoys best month in 33 years despite 20% plus unemployment. I want you to I want that to register in your brains. Americans are suffering. We are north of 20% unemployment and the stock market is racing to the top. I want you to just digest that. That tells you that we have an economic system that isn't truly a moral system. If that is what you see, you know, give me the inputs, give me the outputs, and I tell you a lot about what it is, what's the foundation. So that is probative. Anyway, we're coming to the end of the show. And look, I want to thank you guys for listening to me. I, I, I thank you guys for the airs because I know there are many other places that you could be, but you're here with Politics Done Right, both my left and my right flanks. So thank you so kindly for being a part of what we must be, working together and my, my right is here in, in this chat, in the chat portion of our program. I'm going to just tell you straight up. I know a lot of you, uh, when it comes down to policy, if you had to vote on a policy, you'd be voting identical to what I am talking about here. So welcome aboard. I know you're all smart, so you'll do the right thing. Anyhow, folks, please remember to go to store.politicsunright.com. Store.politicsunright.com. And what do I want you to do at store.politicsunright.com? Please consider going ahead and getting our T-shirt, like the T-shirt you see on there. Or go ahead and get our book. And which book am I talking about? 
as I see it, class warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom. You want to learn how our managed economy really is managed and not as free as you thought it was? We can learn and learn about it together. Learn, read that book, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Anyhow, so that is As I See It, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom. You can also pick that up at Amazon.com. But again, if you want to take out the middleman, consider getting it from us. Likewise, if the thing that we really, really need are subscribers of Politics Done Right. So please go ahead and consider going to patreon.com slash politics done right. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash politics done right and become a subscriber. It's inexpensive and you know you're doing something positive. There's a lot more to happen. We have a couple of Congress people on next week as well. And we have, I think next week I should have the mayor of, the former mayor of Nar of a rally on next week. So we are going to have some very good people, progressives and otherwise. I mean, I have a good, a good Republican on on Monday, uh, Jim Reneshi. Check him out. He wrote a book that uh, that I'm telling folks, hey, you guys should check out this guy's book because you know what? Uh, and as much as we had some disagreement, I think he's a good guy. Uh, anyhow, also please consider going to paypal.me slash politics and right. Again, that is paypal. Dot me slash politics done right. PayPal.me slash politics done right. You can support the show there either on a monthly basis or a singular basis. At Patreon, you can support us however you want. P A T R E O N dot com slash politics done right. And of course, go to our store, store dot politics done right. Com. I want to thank you guys so kindly for having spent this time with me. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right. And you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out! I'm Egberto Willis, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel. And please, leave me some comments. Thank you very much.